we'd like to invite the adults to wait patiently for the children to walk patiently. <laughs> All right, almost there. <laughs> Good morning. Well, I'm Scott Walls, and I'm here with Dave Kratt and Jillian Richardson to tell the story of this year's mission trip to Honduras. Please find the sheet included in the bulletin for the statistics of the trip. It's on the back side of the map of the flag. And those statistics are compelling enough, but I'd like to fill in the story a little bit behind those numbers. Medical professionals and volunteers make early commitments to be members of this team. They get their shots, make plane, plane and travel reservations, and pay a fee to help fund the mission. This mission is interesting, and I'll, I'll go off script a little bit here. We have medical professionals that shut down their practice and come to Honduras to serve for a week and a half in a clinic. Um, some of them brought three other family members, so a family of four came down. And if you look at the numbers from this trip, about two-thirds to three-quarters of the trip is funded by the people who travel to participate in the trip itself. So this is a mission trip that is greatly funded by the people that attend. We'd like to change that a little bit, so I'll be talking to mission committee about seeing if we can increase this church's involvement financially with this mission trip. But that's a unique aspect of this particular mission trip, is that uh, the people volunteer their time, shut down their businesses, but then pay to go and serve. Um, on June 20th, the Americans board planes early in the morning so that all can be in San Pedro Sula in time to leave for the buses, leave on buses for Azacualpa, the home of our, our, our clinic this year. After two and a half hours in school buses with no air conditioning, we, are, we arrive and are given room assignments, begin unloading and setting up our sleeping quarters. We eat a light meal and go to our rooms to settle in and get some sleep. It's dark by 5.30 and most of us are asleep by nine o'clock. Dawn comes very early in Honduras. Birds chirping, dogs barking, and a cacophony of roosters beginning in earnest sometime around five. If that doesn't wake you, Klaus Bergman, playing his accordion, will certainly wake you. Sunrise is over by 5.30, and it is unusually bright by 6 a.m. Time to dress and meet for the daily devotionals that begin at 6.30. We are given our assignments to set up the task of setting up the oral surgery, general dentistry, pharmacy, sterilization, physical therapy, adult and pediatric medicine, a very complete medical clinic. It was a long day, dinner, then we're off to bed. The next six days start similarly, but are quickly filled with a buzz of activity. Each morning a long line is at the gate to the compound, and there are people seeking medical help. We direct them to various areas of triage depending on their medical needs. The team goes into action and an amazing number of people are helped each day. Before we know it, the week is over. It's time to break down the clinic. An entire truckload of inventoried equipment heads off to storage. We say our goodbyes, but we're all discussing when we think we can come again. Soon we board flights to home to much missed family and friends but we are changed. We've been taught something to do in our daily lives. Wake to praise God, work hard, and put others' needs before our own. Well, I'm David Kratt, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here this morning. I've been a member here at Second Presbyterian for 25 years. And uh, this was my first international mission trip. I've been interested in the trip uh, since meeting Dan, even before he actually started working here, because he's talked about it. Um, I'm going to sidetrack just for a second here and, and extend another welcome to Richard Dwyer, because uh, Richard officiated at Laurel and my wedding almost 25 years ago. It's kind of nice to re reconnect here for when I was thinking about 25 years going by. But anyway, I was asked to comment on the you know, what I gained from the Honduran experience. And I guess the only way I thought about doing that was tell you what I did. And uh, kind of following up on Scott's comments that the first day and the day after the clinic shut down, I was part of the uh, mechanical elect electrical engineering team that helped set up the, 
the circuitry and the vacuum system and, and the other components that help serve the clinic rooms uh, during, the, during the actual clinic time. But that, and we, we, it ran pretty smoothly, uh, which I shouldn't be surprised because I've been doing this a long time, but that doesn't really say what I did during the rest of the week. So when the clinic was actually open, so I thought maybe the thing I can do is explain how the Hondurians communicated with me uh, during the time I was helping in clinic, and then I'll tell you why. So this is an example of how most of them communicated when I was interacting during the day. Oh, 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 oh. Now, what I did was, uh, and I had no preparation for this and no advance notice, no specific training, uh, but Dan assigned me to work with the dental surgery part of the clinic uh, with maybe a half an hour's advance notice. So I remember looking at my watch about 8.15 or 8.20 Monday morning, the first day of clinic, going, wow, you know, here I've already assisted with three or four extractions and two different patients. So, uh, you know, it was a totally new experience. I'm, I'm all for that. It, it's really, a, a, it was a blessing to be able to help. And, and they had very experienced, I should say, they had very experienced doctors actually running, doing the surgery. Uh, I could provide suction and help and extra hands. Uh, but I'm not a very good, I don't have a conversational Spanish in my repertoire. so. I uh, had to kind of work with that. Um, it really, again, it was amazing uh, when you look at the numbers that Scott referenced, uh, the dental clinic or the, the surgical clinic, we extracted almost 1,200 teeth during the week and there were seven chairs all in the little school room. And that means I, if I was one seventh of that total, I was somewhere between 170 or closer to 200 teeth I helped extract or helped the, the, the surgeon extract. So that's again for for a dumb old engineer that's pretty interesting work the uh, the really interesting thing to me you know the the people that came you know i i remember very clearly working on a three-year-old and also an 81 year old an 81 year old there's not many of them down there and not very many of them have teeth either but they uh, in fact the 81 year old came back for a second day to get more teeth extracted the last day but they are uh they're Health care, and particularly their dental care, is, is far below U.S. standards. But these people come, they show up. Uh, they're, you know, it's very humbling because they're coming to get, you know, service of some sort, uh, counseling, medical provisions, dental provisions, and they show up in droves. Uh, I know stories of people that left their homes at 4 a.m. in the morning to walk two hours, got to the gate at 6 a.m. so they'd be ready when the gates opened at 8 a.m. To, to receive care. And, you know, to trust somebody like me that is going to inflict some kind of pain on them and, and still show up and happy and even come back a second time in a few cases is very, very humbling. Uh, a couple other things just real quickly to note is uh, I had the great experience of my 21-year-old daughter, Shelby, was able to go. Uh, she's a rising senior in college. and maybe looking at a medical profession of some sort. And so this was a tremendous opportunity for her to learn about herself and about the profession. She rotated to pretty much all the clinics. She speaks pretty good conversational Spanish, so she had a lot more ability to help out there. Uh, that the, again, the experience she gained was immeasurable. I got to see her dance salsa dancing with some of the young Honduran men. And, uh, also get to, you know, maybe get to some hope that uh, all the money and time we were helping her with college is going to pay off at some point. Uh, in summary, God has generously poured out grace upon each of us here, no question. And I think in turn, uh, the, the right thing to do and expectation is we pour out grace on others. Uh, for me, the experience was truly one of, you know, walking on water, if you want to call it that. Um, it was getting out of the routine, getting out of our, our daily experiences and our comfort zones uh, and getting, you know, just looking for those faith opportunities that we all should be looking for to kind of grow ourselves and get out of the boat a little bit more often occasionally. And I encourage each of you to look how you can help support this mission in any way and also other missions as well. And in closing, uh, don't forget to brush your teeth at least twice a day and floss regularly. So. Jillian Richardson.
Trying to convey all that the last two Honduras trips have brought me would take far longer than what time we have here today. There are many experiences that are difficult to translate out of their origins. I have made friends from all over the Western Hemisphere, learned things about another culture and in turn about my own, and gained a profound respect for the dedication it takes to do this year after year. When speaking to Dan prior to my first trip last year, I was less than excited about going to Honduras. He made it sound unpleasant. The cold showers, the lack of privacy, <laughs> the long, hot days in clinic. What he couldn't convey to me, and what I'm sure I will struggle to convey to anyone who hasn't yet had such an experience, is that those things are hardly the memories you bring back. What I have taken away from these trips is a long list full of wonderful things that I would gladly suffer much worse than chili water, chicken gunya, and lots of sweating for. I went to Honduras for the first time to build my medical school resume. I wanted to make myself look better to the world around me. What I have accomplished, however, was to find better eyes with which to see the world and humbler hands with which to give back. I took a risk and it has paid off in more ways than I could ever count. Fortune favors the bold. And in going to Honduras, I found that my own fortune came only when I was willing to be a little bolder. So for those of you listening, perhaps taking a step outside your comfort zone sounds like a risk you might be willing to take. Maybe not. But if you're willing to try something that gives you better eyes with which to see the world while giving back, Signups for Honduras 2016 aren't too far off. I'll see you there. Thank you.